Amen. God bless you, church. Uh, good to see you this evening. Pastor Mike Mestis from New Hope in Christ in Denver, Colorado. We're uh, in the Comfort Inn Conference Center, 401 East 58th Avenue, off of uh, Interstate 25 and 58th Avenue in the Comfort Inn Conference Center. Come visit us Sundays at 10, Thursdays at 6. Amen. Well, um, I want to talk tonight about uh, the spirit of depression. Depression has uh, a way of coming on a person to cause them to lose sight of uh, the destiny in their life. A person uh, can live life, go forward, and out of the clear blue sky, darkness can come. And what this darkness does is it brings us to a place where uh, we don't have hope and we're discouraged and we can't seem to break out and find what God really uh, wants for us. Uh, we lose our discernment sometimes. Sometimes we'll lose our faith. Sometimes we'll lose uh, our joy and victory. But that's what I want to talk about tonight is that God has a way of getting us out of these issues in this situation. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, uh, Paul is going through a very difficult dilemma. But I want you to know that, um, to, to encourage you, that Christ went through uh, similar situations in his own ministry when he broke out and uh, he went into the desert and he had to face uh, the temptations of the enemy and he had to make a decision between right and wrong, good and evil, and uh, victory and defeat. And he chose all the right things because he's uh, Jesus, he's the Lord. But uh, we need to learn to choose the right things. And in doing that, um, I want to talk to you about Paul. And then I want to discuss Elijah to a degree as well. But in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 9, uh, God speaks to Paul and tells him something very profound. And in speaking to him, it was uh, a no-defeat clause in the Word of God that God told Paul, he said, look, my grace is sufficient for you. And uh, uh, then he, he goes on to say, for uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, uh, when God says that his strength is made perfect in your weakness, what he's saying is that in a time of defeat, that's when God is operating the best. When we're down and out, that's when he comes in and he begins to stabilize and give us victory. But uh, through it all, we have to hold on. So I want to read 2 Corinthians 12, and let's walk through this. It starts out with, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. <clears throat> I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now the third heaven is uh, where the throne of God is. <clears throat> and he says, And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So he's saying, Look, I, I received some information when I was in the third heaven I can't even tell you about because it was so powerful yet so uh, private. Verse 5, of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. So he's saying that, look, being uh, in the third heaven, I'm going to boast about it but as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to say anything about me. And verse 6, For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, 
for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So Paul is setting uh, a scenario down, telling us, look, I'm, I'm a, a powerful man of God. And all of these powerful things that took place in my life are uh, a blessing. But there's uh, God giving me revelation, God giving me truth, God giving me insight is one thing. But what God does is he has to settle us to the place where we're not bragging on ourselves. We're not talking about us, but we're talking about him. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, yet uh, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, this thorn in the flesh that uh, Paul received was something that was uh, had to do with his flesh, and it was painful. And it was allowed to be in Paul's life so that uh, he could begin to uh, write what God wants and he could begin to uh, cause to subside what he wanted. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Okay, now three times. That's uh, pretty deep because uh, we'll beg and beg and beg until uh, we feel that something uh, happens that uh, needs to happen. And what God many times wants to do is he wants to shut us off, shut us down, and pull us back and say, look, just be still and know that I am God. So he goes on to say in verse 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, my wife, Josie, got this uh, scripture given to her by a man named Harry Hills, who's a, a great evangelist of the past, and he's still operating in the things of God in uh, Kingman, Arizona. But what happens here is this word was given to my wife, and uh, we didn't understand it at the time, but now we do, and we understand it very much so. When God says that my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made weakness uh, through you, or uh, he said, don't uh, brag on what you are, but let God be uh, the the victory in everything. But he also says that, look, you're going to go through difficulties. You're going to go through pain. You're going to experience hard times. But I want you never to forget that my grace is enough. So uh, it's, it's a very difficult word to receive, but yet it being given is something that we need to take with humility and say, okay, God, I'll swallow my pill and go on. Verse uh, 10, <clears throat> therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Church, when uh, the thorn in the flesh uh, spirit uh, comes upon you and you're getting attacked physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it may be, I want you to know that God's grace is on you. God's got your back and has you covered. But know this, that when you're weak, he's strong. And when you don't have an answer, he does, and he'll guide you through it. Now, as we look at many great men who, of God who faced this depressive dilemma, one of them uh, is Elijah. <clears throat> now, uh, this man in all his glory and the power of Christ in us, he walked uh, in such a magnificent fashion. 
he called upon uh, the clouds and God that there would be no rain. And there was no rain. And uh, when he called upon God to do this, we begin to see that this man of God was a man of power. He called on God to stop the rain from falling on Israel. That occurring was a great, great way of uh, expressing God's power in you. And uh, what, what Elijah does is he challenges Ahab. And when he challenges Ahab, he also challenges 450 demonic prophets uh, before all of Israel on Mount Carmel. And in chapter 18, we uh, go through it. And if we go to verse 38, we can see uh, how this thing begins to unfold and operate. So I'm going to read the verse to you so that you can grab uh, a hold of what God, God is wanting to do. And uh, verse 37 says, Hear me, O Lord, hear, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then Elijah told them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and executed them there. So in uh, this activity, we see that God comes down. He consumes the sacrifice with uh, it being filled with water. God's uh, awesome presence comes, licks up this sacrifice, and then Elijah kills the prophets. Let's look at uh, verses 41 through 46. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat, drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down to the ground, put his face between his knees, and said to the servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up, looked, and said, There is nothing. So... <clears throat> A lot of times we'll operate in this and uh, our servants or our uh, armor bearers or who, whatever and whoever it may be, they go and they look out and they say, there's nothing there. And uh, they're ready to give up. Okay, well, we'll go another time. We'll go number two. So this servant goes out and he says, hey, man, it's a cloudless day. I don't see anything. And so when he does this, he does this seven times. Seven times Elijah commands the servant to go out. Now why does he do this? Because Elijah is so confident in God and who he is that he trusts that somehow, some, some way, God is going to move. And this is the kind of man of God we need to be, woman of God we need to be. This man of God was a man of power and faith and anointing and greatness. So the uh, servant, uh, then it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Elijah is talking uh, scientifically, spiritually, and supernaturally. Number one, in faith, he's uh, trusted that now that he sees this cloud the size of a man's fist, he says, okay, servant, run to Ahab and tell him that uh, rain is coming, 
and to get on his chariot and ride to Jezreel. And in this process, all of Israel comes and they get it right with God. They get saved. They turn their hearts over to the Lord. And Elijah is under the impression that Ahab has done the same thing because he verbalized it, but his heart never changed. Nonetheless, he goes ahead, he tells him to go tell him, get on his chariot and, and ride. And so he does that. And uh, what happens is we see that God has caused a great and miraculous thing to take place. So I want to go to chapter 19 now. And in uh, chapter 19, uh, we begin the process of verses 1 through 4. This is where the demonic attack of fear comes on Elijah. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Depression has set in on Elijah. When did it occur? At the peak of victory. When did it occur? At the confidence of self was so high that nothing could knock him off his horse. When did it come? It came during a period that Elijah, for a moment, took his eyes off of the grandeur of the I Am and put them on himself. So this occurs, and uh, he hears Jezebel say these words to him. It brings a huge amount of fear upon him. I'm imagining that here he is, Elijah, and all of this demonic host comes to his head and begins to whisper and speak and send fear signals into his spirit, into his mind, and cause him to snap, lose sight of what he had just done, lose sight of the miracles of God, and get a sight of darkness, depression, and evil that had surrounded him completely and totally. But why did God allow it? Why did God let this happen? I think God wanted to allow a test to come upon Elijah to see that Elijah, it's not you, it's me. Elijah, it's not your power, it's my power. Elijah, don't be intimidated by the voices in your head and the spiritual darkness that surrounds you. I'm here with you, Elijah, so quit fearing and running. <clears throat> and so the next thing that happens is uh, there are three times that others want to encourage us. Uh, there are times, rather, that others want to encourage us. And in 1 Kings uh, 19, 5 through 6, it says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Angels want to rescue you. An angel could be an individual in your life, but angels are there. Verse 6, then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals, a jar of water. So he ate, drank, and laid down again. Depression is a spirit that wants you to sleep. Depression is darkness. Depression is fear. Depression is a lie. 
Depression is something that puts a hold on you. You've just experienced seeing an angel. You look at the angel. You see the miraculous. You see the food. You eat the food, and you go back into bed. Church, that's how depression operates in mankind's life. Depression is a hell pit action that comes upon human beings. The next thing that depression wants to do is cause us to go to sleep and forget about the dilemma. He wants us to hide out. He wants us to cover our heads. He wants us to cry. He wants us to sleep. He doesn't want us to get up and move. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came back the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So now this angel comes. Another one comes again, or the same one, wakes him up, says, Look, you got to eat, because what you're about to face, you're going to need your energy. God knows what you need. Have you ever come off a fast or you've been uh, in a position where God's allowed you to eat, but he wants you to get back on the fast? And God will tell you specifically what to eat. He'll tell you, I want you to take three spoons of honey. I want you to eat bread and I want you to have a potato or whatever it is. But the nutrient that God puts on your heart to eat is purposeful so that you can go the forward journey to overcome and break the back of depression. Amen? So now we go, and uh, what happens is many times what we want to do is we want to go into the cave and hide and be alone and sleep some more. I want you to read with me verse 9 and 10 in 1 Kings 19. <clears throat> and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Okay, now let's get this straight. First, Elijah runs, he freaks out and he goes to a place where he uh, crashes and burns and he's in depression. God wakes him up, says, eat, wakes him up a sec second time, says, eat, because the journey that you have ahead of you which is 40 days and 40 nights, you won't survive if you don't eat what I'm telling you to eat. So Elijah does that, and then God says, what are you doing here? God, you just told me that I've got a long journey ahead of me. What God is really doing is he's saying to Elijah, what are you really doing here? What are you doing in that bed, person? What are you doing hiding out? What are you doing not uh, avoiding people? What are you doing avoiding the phone calls? What are you doing not going to church? What are you doing not facing your situations? What are you doing? God's questioning us, church, because he knows to wake us up. He has to speak to us, and he has to speak to us now. Verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your uh, covenant, have not forsaken your covenant, uh, or Israel has forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. It's only me, God. I'm the only one here. And guess what? People are seeking to kill me. What people, Elijah? Well, this girl. What? A girl? Yeah, she said she was going to make my blood uh, fall onto the streets of Jezreel, and the dogs were going to lick it up, and they were going to eat me up. What am I supposed to do, God? Elijah, a girl? Really? Okay, good then. Let's uh, go on. So he goes on, but... What God is doing is God wants to question us. And in this questioning, he's wanting us to wake up and he's wanting us to really see what is taking place in our lives. Amen. 
So when he says this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses uh, uh, 9 and 10, he says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'd rather brag about my sickness and problems than that the power of Christ may be on me. Verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in need, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? Okay, many times we want to make excuses. No one else has been here, God. We're the only ones going through this. I am the only one that has ever experienced the difficulty of my life. Nobody else has, Lord. You know that. And uh, what we're trying to do is make excuses so that God will feel sorry for us, pull us out of this mess, and uh, give us strength and brighten our eyes and make us happy. Well, the next thing that God wants to speak to us or other people, he wants to help you through the dilemma, 11 through 13 of 1 Kings 19. Then he said, go out, <clears throat> stand on the mountain. Check this out. Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. What this is saying, church, is God may not cause fireworks to break out in your life. God may not send an angel to wake you up and feed you. God may not send uh, anybody into your life. He may not send a lightning bolt. He may not crash and burn and uh, something around you. He may not even speak loud to you, but he will eventually speak. And how does he want to speak to us, church? In a still, small voice. Elijah. 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 We're waiting for a very clear and astounding voice of God, and God is just saying, Elijah. When we see these things, we need to know that the power of God is going to move regardless of your dilemma. And it's going to move in a gentle, still, small voice. Verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Church, if you notice, you can see in verses 10, as you go further on, verse 14, that there are the exact same excuses of depression that rails upon us. Verse 14, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. We always seem to think we alone are left. And God is saying, get your butt out of that bed. Get your butt out of that house 
and go. Recognize the enemy who is at hand in your life to cause destruction. The enemy wants you to stay in a circle and not come out of the issue of your life. He wants you to stay there so he'll entrap your thought. He'll entrap your mind and try to break you so that you won't wake up and make a move. This spirit, it's repetitious. It's never ending until we end it with the word of God. Why don't you look at 1 John chapter 4 verse 4. This is what God says to us when he speaks to get us out of these dilemmas of uh, failure, of dis uh, discouragement, depression, pain, sorrow. I want you to see what he says in 4.4. 4. 1 John says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Don't get trapped by the trickery of voice. Get to moving, get to seeking, and get to doing something for God. God tells us these things. He tells us best in 1 Peter, if you look at that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures in the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 6 and 7, previous to this, tells us a key. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. <laughs> oh, God cares for us, church. God is the God that loves us. God is the God that uh, beckons us to come forward. James 4, 7 says, says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Isaiah 41, 10 tells us a word that is so powerful and so encouraging. Isaiah always has to seem, always seems to have the right word for us as we go through difficulties, as we face these harsh dilemmas that the devil wants to defeat us in. And this is what he says in Isaiah 41, 10. He says this, church, Amen. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. God is key, church, to everything. God's the one that's going to get us through this. God's the one that's going to break the back and bondages of the Satan himself. He is the one that's going to walk us out. He is the one that's going to win our hearts. And he is the one that's going to win the victory. And in Philippians chapter 4, the Word of God says it best. I want you to look at what Philippians 4, 8 says. 
Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on these things. Verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Church, be anxious for nothing. Our God shall supply your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We can break and defeat depression. We can break and defeat the enemy in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, church. Hold to these words and understand the path that God wants you to be a victor in. Have a wonderful night and walk in great and awesome victory. This is Pastor Mike Mestis saying to you, have a beautiful and praiseworthy night. Amen.